welcome to the Read Local Show presented by Lit Carney Bell and me, your host, Toy Thomas, author, blogger, and reading advocate. I am so excited to share today's guest with you. Mike Krantz writes character-centric medical suspense, psychological thrillers, and military fiction based on his experience as an emergency physician and U.S. Navy medical officer. So let's meet Mike Krantz. So it is so nice to meet you, Mike Krantz. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, sure. Uh, my, as you said, my name is Mike Krantz. I'm, uh, I'm actually a, a retired physician. Wow. Uh, although uh, that's my dog in the background. I'm sorry. She's, she's the neighborhood watchdog. <laughs> and of course, she's barking at the kids who are out there enjoying, enjoying the, the holiday. So sorry about that. Oh, it's okay. Um, you might hear my dog too. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Any, anyway, uh, yeah, I uh, actually majored in English in college uh, many, many, many years ago. And, and so I've always had a, an interest in writing. Uh, but I went to medical school and I, I practiced emergency medicine as a, as a civilian for uh, quite a few years. And then uh, I joined the Navy and I was a, a Navy doctor. Uh, for uh, another career, and uh, I got to do a lot of really neat stuff, meet a lot of really neat people, uh, both in shore-based and, and on, on ships and aviation commands and such. So when it came time to uh, finally retire from the Navy, um, I, I decided that for my next career, uh, I would be a writer. And so I wrote, uh, I wrote a number of uh, uh, novels based on my experiences in, in, the, in the Navy as a Navy physician, and I self-published those. They did okay. They weren't uh, blockbusters by any means. <laughs> and uh, after, after a few years, I, I'd been out of the Navy really too long, and, and my knowledge was not current, and I, and I really wanted to, to write about my experiences as an emergency physician. And so I wrote uh, this novel, Dead Already, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, actually got it published uh, traditionally through a, a small press called Touchpoint Press. They've been nice. wonderful to me. And, and uh, it, it's done you know, fairly well for, for a, a, not a big press uh, thing. And uh, then I wrote a, a second book, Angels Falling, mm -hmm. which is a, a psychological suspense uh, novel just released uh, last January by the same Touchpoint Press. Meanwhile, I've, uh, I'm reworking the, those four original military fiction novels, and, and they're coming out uh, as uh, revised editions, if you will. Uh, and, and I just sent in uh, to the publisher the, uh, the draft of the sequel to that already. So that's, that's what I've been doing since I retired. It, it, I don't do well at golf and, and <laughs> gardener. Uh, so uh, I just sit at my computer and write. <laughs> well, it sounds like you're um, keeping yourself very busy with it. So that's good. <laughs> I am, I am. All right, so I have a couple of um, segments that I you know, came up with to help this interview process along. But I always like to start out by mentioning that on top of me, you know, being an author, blogger, and just being an overall book lover, I consider myself a reading advocate. I feel like everyone should have a healthy reading lifestyle. And I recognize that that's going to be a little different for everyone. So my first question for you is, do you think that reading is something that is essential to a well-balanced life? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I, credit, uh, I credit my mother for that. My mother was an avid, avid reader, uh, way before there was any such thing as Kindles or, or, or online anything. Uh, she had bookshelves full of books and, and she was an avid reader. So from, from very early in my life, uh, uh, I was taught and emulated that, uh, that lifestyle. Um, I, I think it's sad, uh, really. To, to have a life where you don't read because it's such a constricting uh, effect if, if you don't have the ability to, to pick up a book and, and go to another world. 
uh, get to meet new people, get to meet people who are different and, and uh, that you're never going to meet in real life. It's a tremendously expansive opportunity and uh, one that uh, I think is, is sadly uh, not done enough in today's society. Wow. I love the way you like worded that to say that it was an expansive experience. I think you hit the nail on the head. I think a lot of people are missing out. I mean, of course, yeah. you know, we have situations where there's a big um, push to spread literacy. And of course, we want everyone to have the opportunity to read. But I do feel like there's a lot of places where people have the ability to read and they just don't. And um, I do think that if, especially in America, if we put a little bit more um, emphasis on reading as a, val as a valid form of entertainment, just like television and movies and sports, more people would read and have a more well-balanced life. So. I agree with that. And, and I think that uh, it has to start young. Uh, I, I really, really um, honor my wife who is also an avid reader and has been all her life. And, and she got our kids started uh, way out, well before preschool in, in reading. And, and those, those children are now adults and they're teaching their children at very early ages to read. And I think that's, that's where it has to happen. Uh, and we can't just rely on the schools or the churches or uh, whatever to, to inculcate that that love of reading in people, it, it starts young. And hopefully once you've learned it, you continue to do it. Too many distractions in this world right now. Uh, yeah. Makes it hard, makes it hard. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. So um, I love I love your response to that. And I, I do think starting young helps a lot. I remember reading a lot as a, as a kid. And then I do definitely remember getting into college and like not reading because I had all this required reading. <laughs> but once I got over that, I went right back to, you know, my love of yeah. reading. So, yeah. all right. So I have some other questions for you. So sure. this is for the segment that I call on the bookshelf where we do talk about kind of your, you and your um, reading life. And so one of the questions that I love to ask people, cause I'm just curious is, are there any books or do you reread books? After you've like read it one time, do you ever go back and reread a book? I, I don't. Uh, and, and the reason I don't is because I'm a slow reader to begin with. And there's so many other books that I want to read that uh, I do not necessarily reread a book. Um, I, I do like to watch the movies as they come out or the TV series or whatever to, to kind of relive that. But, but I don't reread them, no. Yeah, I, I know a lot of people who have given me that same answer. So it makes perfect sense. My problem is, is that I do reread books and sometimes I wish I wouldn't because I'm like, I have other books that I wanna read. Why am I reading something I already know the ending to? <laughs> um, a, a very well-written book, uh, I think is is a pleasure in itself, and even if you know the characters and the plot and the ending, uh, I can I can see where somebody would would want to go back and reread the book just just to experience it, just for the pleasure of sharing something that the author put on the page uh, with the intention of having it shared. Well, that's cool. <laughs> I think I guess that's what it is for me is that, and I don't mm -hmm. reread a lot of books. There's just a handful of them, but yeah. Uh, so the next question that I have for you is, um, <laughs> so this one again is just, you know, you as a reader, is there a particular book that um, was maybe kind of popular enough to where people, you maybe talked about it in the news or whatever, and it was like a story or a concept that you wish you had come up with? Oh, wow. Uh, Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. <laughs> uh, I mean, J.K. Rowling's imagination and, and the, the, the world that she built uh, in those novels uh, just blows me away. I, I, I wish I had an imagination like that and the ability to sustain it over, what, seven novels and keep all those characters uh, new and alive and interesting. 
I, I think it's just marvelous work, marvelous work. And then she went on and wrote a, a mystery series under the, the pseudonym of Robert Galbraith and did the same thing. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely her. Yeah, I I have had a you know several different times where I've read something and I'm like, man, that's I wish I could you know do something like that. It's just so uh, impressive. But I think when you read books like that that motivates you to be, you know, a better writer, so. It does, it, it, it very, very definitely does. Uh, and and reading, reading as a writer, uh, you can not only uh, love the story and share the world and, and enjoy the characters and get to know the characters, but you can learn a lot about writing. If you read people like, uh, like J.K. Rowling, like John Irving, uh, like John Grisham, uh, all of all of these, whether they whether they write literary fiction or genre fiction or whatever, there's something to learn from every book you read if you're a writer. Yes, and it can make your own craft better. Exactly, I I definitely agree with that. It is kind of disheartening sometimes when I have conversations with other writers and they tell me that they don't read other people's books, and I'm just like, no, don't tell me that. How do you expand yourself as a writer if you're not reading something? But okay. <laughs> I agree. I, I, I can't imagine um, being in such a such a constrained environment as to have only your own experience and your own uh, you know knowledge, your own craft that you've personally developed and, and miss out on all the all the things you can learn from other uh, authors, particularly the ones that have been tremendously successful. Yeah. All right. So that was pretty much the questions that I had for your um, your role as a reader. So now I want to talk a little bit about um, you as a writer and kind of some of your writing process. So the first question that I like to start with is I like to start with the fun stuff. <laughs> so every Every writer has their own process. Of course, you know, there's some kind of, you know, standard labels. You can say, oh, I'm a plotter or a pantser or something like that. But I think every person's um, process is unique to them. So for you, what do you feel is the favorite, your favorite part of your writing process? My favorite part, and I just to I'll pick up on, on the buzzwords that you mentioned. I, I consider myself a planter. I'm <laughs> okay. neither, neither a plotter nor a, nor a pantser. I, I, I start off with a with a concept and 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 then chew on it and develop it and chew on it and develop. But my my favorite uh, part of the process is once having gotten through the first draft, going back and pulling it all together. It, it, it's kind of like uh, the first draft, first draft is is, is like a, a bunch of cats running all over the place, and, and literally the second draft for me is is herding those cats, uh, putting some of them outside because they don't belong in the room at all, mm -hmm. uh, and and throwing some order around it, and and ending up with a with a cohesive story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and character arcs, and plot development, and all that. Uh, the first draft just really just tends to be a, uh, you know, like an artist throwing paint at a canvas. This color looks good, wham. See how that works out. I like the way you talked about hurt, hurting the cats and like you put some of them out. I know um, for me, going through that process and having to figure out the things that don't belong that's one of the hard parts for me um but it is a necessary part because like you said when you come up with that first draft it's not likely that all of that stuff is going to end up in the final draft <laughs> I've, I've noticed actually uh, two things happen to me after the first draft one one is as you say it, it contains a lot of material that uh, just ended up on the page that, that needs to be cut uh, the, other, the other thing that happens to me uh, is it can be too much bare bones and I have to go back and during the revision and, and add meat to those bones because I've been so focused on the primary plot uh, and kind of forgot about description and scene setting and all those things that puts the reader into the story. 
So I, I find myself doing both, either adding to or subtracting or probably both processes simultaneously to, to come up with a finished product. Well, that's pretty good. I mean, I mean, that makes sense. I think I, I probably, I know I do that as well, but I think I focus on, no, I don't want to have to take that out, but it's got to go. <laughs> so the next question that I have for you is kind of piggyback on um, being a reader as a writer. Are, are there any particular books that you have found that have helped you hone your writing craft? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Stephen King's book on writing. I love is, that one. It's sort of a, um, if, you, if you're a writer and you haven't read Stephen King's book, you're not a writer yet. <laughs> uh, basically, I mean, he, he just absolutely nails it. Um, there, there's uh, uh, another um, person who writes about writing who's also an author and a literary agent on top of that. Her name is Paula Meunier. And, and Paula has written four books, uh, at least four books on writing uh, in terms of plot development, uh, great beginnings, character development, that sort of thing. I got a lot out of those. Uh, but th those are the, the, the primary book for, for uh, there's, there's one other, and I'm going to block on the title, but the author's name is Hallie Efron, E-P-H-R-O-N. Uh, for anybody who writes mysteries or thrillers, Hallie F. Efron has a wonderful book out. Uh, I think it's a Writer's Digest book okay. uh, on uh, writing mysteries. And, and that's also a, a very good book. So, so in terms of books about writing, I, those are the ones that I would primarily turn to. Yeah, yeah I've, I've read this the Stephen King book on writing and it, it was really good. Yeah. And um I'm not like a huge fan of Stephen King. I appreciate a lot of his work, you know, but when I read that book, I think it gave me a completely different perspective on the other works of his that I had read. So I do think as a writer, that's one of the books that you definitely got to pick up at least once. Totally agree. And my last question for you, um, what are your thoughts on writing prompts? Do you use them, love them, hate them? What do you think about writing prompts? I, I don't use them. And, and the reason I don't use them is because they're somebody else's writing prompts. Okay. And, and maybe, you know, I, I might be missing out on a tremendous opportunity here. Uh, but I have my own writing prompts. I, I have my own sense of, of what I want to write about and, and what I want my story to be about. So I'm never, uh, I, I never sit down and think, well, what am I going to write about today? Uh, it's, it's, it's more for me the process of what am I not going to write about today? <laughs> All these things that are these ideas that are running around inside my head, which one am I going to focus on and, and, and see through to the finish? So I, I, don't, I don't do write or writing prompts. Okay. And that, that, could be, that could be a mistake. No, I think it, I think every situation is different. I mean, if you've got if you have no shortage of ideas, then you probably don't need the writing prompts, you know. With that said, do you keep like a list of all the different story ideas that you're working on or that you want to work on at some point? Uh, I, I actually did uh, at one point. I, I don't really do that because just simply because of what I'm focusing on right now, which is the uh, the, the Dr. Zach Winston series, the, the Dead Already uh, mm -hmm. series that I'm working on. And so I already know what I'm going to write about because it's not more of the same, but different iterations of, of the same core uh, conflict. Cool. I like that. Yeah. All righty. So now we're going to move on to the next section of the program that I like to call a book signing. And this is where we get to get a little bit more in depth on some of those specific works that you've produced. I'm very excited to be talking about Already Dead since I see your cool post, I mean, Dead Already. I see your cool poster back there. You showed us the book for that and also um, Angels Falling. So I'm just going to jump right in and ask you some questions about some of these publications. Sure. So my first question is, what exactly are the major themes and topics in Dead Already? It, there, there's a core, uh, core theme that gets itself into all of my books. And it's called, I call it redemption, uh, for want of a better term. 
my, my stories um, deal with characters who who are flawed in some way, as we all are. Yeah. Um, you know, results of results of, uh, of either past trauma or past life experiences or uh, significant uh, life mistakes, and and they 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 are challenged. Uh, there's conflict, and in the process of um, dealing with that conflict and also interacting with other characters uh, as they deal with that conflict. Uh, brings them to a point in their lives where some of those flaws, uh, while they're not necessarily obliterated, uh, they're, they're at least living with those flaws or those past traumas in a more positive and productive way. So, so for Dead Already, um, the, the protagonist there, the main character is, is an emergency physician, Dr. Zach Winston. And uh, he, he kind of had early, early in his life what many of us doctors had early in our career, which is young doctor syndrome, which is I've been to medical school and I know everything uh, and, and found out in a very uh, difficult way that, that he did not. Uh, he did not uh, know everything about the practice of medicine and he certainly didn't know anything about relationships. So he ended up having to reinvent his life uh, as a Navy physician, uh, where he underwent a, a significant uh, soul crunching uh, trauma. Mm -hmm. And so we pick up the, the story picks up. Uh, he's back in civilian practice after his after his Navy career, and uh, he's subjected to uh, a significant conflict uh, professionally in, okay. in his life. And, and that evolves into a, uh, a mystery and with some, some thrilling aspects in terms of things that threaten not only his life, but uh, the lives of uh, other people around him. Okay. How's that, is that big enough? No, no. <laughs> I didn't give it away, did I? Well, no, because I mean, I, what I was going to ask next, I mean, and you can say as much or as little as you want about it. I yeah. know you want, you would rather people, you know, read the book for themselves. Um, but you definitely have given a description that sounds compelling. You can tell, I think, like you said, the word redemption fits it very well. Um, I was going to ask a little bit about that mystery. You know, is he the one trying to solve the mystery or is he just part of the mystery? He, uh, he actually uh, ends up forming a, a, a partnership uh, with, with another person who's, who's a lawyer, a woman. Uh, and uh, they become somewhat amateur sleuths okay. in terms of uh, figuring out the real story, the real uh, threat, not only to themselves, but to others. So it, it has a little bit of an amateur sleuth uh, component to it, uh, as well as being a, a medical mystery and a, and a, a th thriller. Yeah, you got a lot going on there. We got medical drama, thriller, mystery. I mean, it sounds great. I mean, this is the kind of stuff people sit up and watch late at night on TV. So in a book, it's going to be even more immersive. So I really like the sound of it. Thank you. The next you. question that I have is for um, Angels Falling. First of all, I love the title. I want you to explain the title. But of course, I want you to explain like how that goes into the story. Because I remember you saying that this one was more of a psychological thriller. And I don't know the the uh, there there's a phrase on the on the cover of the book up here at the top. Okay. It says, uh, "How many angels must die to save one human life?" And and that's a bit of a, of a hint uh, of what the story is about. It also deals with uh, concepts of uh, flawed personalities. Um, I, call, I use the term ruptured personalities to describe some of the characters. Uh, and uh, their process in dealing with the conflicts and reaching a, a form of redemption. Uh, this involves uh, three characters, three main characters. The first is uh, a fellow by the name of uh, 
<laughs> can't believe it. Anyway, he's an ex-seminarian, and uh, he was studying to be a priest, and uh, he, he met this other guy uh, named Gabriel, uh, who was also studying to be a priest, and, and there was, uh, in this particular seminary, uh, it was staffed by, by, by young nuns. And so the third character is the nun uh, by, the, by the name of Maria Santos. Uh, something happened. Okay. And uh, the protagonist, whose name I can't remember, I can't believe I'm doing this, uh, <laughs> was, was accused of, uh, of uh, not necessarily molesting, but, but certainly uh, was found in a, in a compromising uh, situation with, with the nun, Maria Santos. So they were both kicked out. Okay. And, and Gabriel went on to become a priest, uh, but uh, he got really weird and ended up uh, actually founding a cult oh. and leaving the church and founding a cult. So uh, fast forward to uh, these, these were all young people in their 20s, fast forward uh, some 20 years, and there's a murder. Um, that involves the Archbishop of Washington. Uh, he's murdered, actually, and his body's left uh, on the altar at, at his cathedral. And uh, these three individuals' lives come together uh, in the wake of this murder in different ways. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, first of all, uh, significant threats, serious threats to, uh, to the community, to each of them individually, and they have to uh, resolve uh, what happened to them 20 years ago and what we basically learn is each of the three has a different memory of what really happened and in the discovery of what really happened um, is where the angels symbolically there's not there's not right. actual angels in the gotcha. world. <laughs> uh, there are there are people who take on the names of angels uh, and their interaction uh, some of them have to no longer be present. Gotcha. I'm not even going to say alive because I don't want to give it all away. Okay. To resolve the story, it, it's it, the psychological part of it is it, is it deals with a with a significant uh, psychological disorder uh, that I'm not going to mention because that would be a spoiler. Okay. Uh, but that plays a significant role in in the uh, evolution of the story. All right. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. Um, I was I was already with you with the with the you know the guys in seminary and then the nun and then something happened and now there's a murder. One guy is leading a cult. I this is definitely interesting. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think a psychological thrillers are definitely a good way of describing that book and. Um, just out of curiosity, I love the um, I love the cover art that you have for Dead already. Um, I like um, Angels Falling as well, but that one just really kind of just stood out to me when I saw it. Um, did you have any say in those cover designs, or did your publisher do that for you? I, I did uh, for for Dead already. I actually found that uh, that electrocardiogram trace, which basically shows uh, a normal heart progressing to uh, abnormality. And the original, the original uh, cover is behind me. Uh, we, won an, we won an award, so they, they put the medallion of the award on the, in the end of it for a, for a revised cover, but it's, it, shows, it shows a normal heart going to asystole. So that's symbolic of, of what happened in the, uh, in the story. I didn't design the cover. I just provided the graphic because right. I have no clue when it comes to fonts, font sizes, et cetera. I have no clue. Uh, the Angels Falling cover is also uh, images that I provided, okay. but the design was was done by the publisher and, and she did just a, a fantastic job on it. I think I've gotten a lot of compliments on it. Uh, and I didn't design it. I just provided it. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it was a, graphics. yeah, it was a wonderful collaboration because both of the covers just really stand out. Um, mm -hmm. They're really great. I like them. 
touch point press. I'll pass yeah. that on. All right. So now we are getting to the part of the show that I call Don't Judge a Book by its cover. This is the part that can be a little silly, but this is just getting to know you, the guy. In, okay. in way like maybe your friends and family might get to know you a little bit. And these are just some silly questions that I came up with. So let's see what we got. <laughs> if you could only pick one, what would it be? Coffee, tea, or wine? In my earlier days, I would have said wine. Now it's coffee. Because I, just because stay awake, stay alert, <laughs> becomes more important than feel the buzz. How many how many cups of coffee a day do you have? I I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Six or more. Six or oh more. wow! Okay. <laughs> My wife and I both boil it down. We make twelve cups. So if each of us has half of that, that's six. Okay. I probably might actually have a little more than she does, though. So. All right. So definitely coffee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so this next one, is, again, is another funny one. Um, so you are a writer. And so we've seen um, as society a couple of movies uh, where they've had depictions of writers in movies. Um, <laughs> um, I can't remember who Stephen King said that. I, I guess when he wrote The Shining, he was thinking of himself. But Jack Nicholson ended up playing him in the movie. <laughs> if they were going to make a movie of your life, who would play you? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. I have, I'm going to have to give that one some thought. Probably Anthony Hopkins. Okay. <laughs> just come, comes in off the top of my head. I can uh, see that. Yeah. Maybe John Malkovich. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like that. <laughs> yeah. So the, the next one that I have is... Um, Never have I ever. Um, so this, if if you if you have done it, just kind of raise your hand. Say, "Yep, I've done it," and tell me about it. And if not, just be like, "No, never done that." So never have I ever lost a library book. I think I did once. And what happened? Did you ever find it? Did you have to pay a fee or something? Apparently not, because I vaguely remember it was like years and years and years ago um, I, I just sort of have this, this vague recollection of a book with those Dewey Decimal System numbers on it <laughs> on a bookshelf and saying mm, I forget to return that but you know fortunately being in the Navy you move around a lot so you don't get caught <laughs> Well, I wish that had happened for me because as an adult, when I tried to get a library card at the city I was living in at the time, they were like, you have an outstanding oh, balance yeah. for a book you lost 10 years ago. And I was like, I was 12, 10 years ago. It turns out my mom lost the book. <laughs> so there's an interesting uh, kind of corollary to that about video rentals back, when, back in the days when there were blockbusters and you, you actually went and rented the video. Uh, the VHS or the or the beta, and uh, I, I got back from deployment uh, once and went to the video store, took back a video, and <laughs> my my wife and kids just had had it for like the six months that I was deployed and never took it back, so I I got to pay the bill. Yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so I have one more fun question for you so what is your um like ideal I don't know how to say this really but like I always see pictures on social media where they have people in like their reading nooks and things like that where is your ideal place to read well I I, I read uh, exclusively on um, a kindle and so I can pretty me pretty much read anywhere mm -hmm. I can best answer that question by telling you my least favorite place to read is in bed because I'm asleep in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty much uh, otherwise, any place where you can go with a Kindle or, or a phone uh, or a tablet, I have a tablet too, uh, and it's quiet, mm -hmm. I can read. I, I can't read 
uh, in an environment where people are yakking. Uh, it's, it's, it's too distracting for me. Yeah. So a quiet place uh, where I can pull out my phone or my Kindle is, is where I like to read. Nice. All right. Well, you know, I, I have enjoyed this so much. I liked um, getting to talk to you about reading and your process, learning more about those two wonderful books. And um, so we're pretty much kind of at the end now. Why don't you go ahead and tell the viewers where they can find you or your work online? Before I do that, okay. if I may, okay. can, I, can I give a plug for the Muse Writer Center? Absolutely. I love the Muse Writer yes. Center. <laughs> yes, the, the, the Muse Writer, Writer Center uh, here in Norfolk, Virginia, it, it is a gem. Uh, it's a gem for writers of all levels. And, and a brief story, and I, I should have mentioned this in the introduction, but, but a brief story. Uh, I, I struggled with debt already for several years trying to get it published. Uh, and, and I got feedback that didn't necessarily help. Uh, I went to a, a pitch fest in New York where you got to spend in-depth time, not just 10 minutes, but like several days with agents and editors. And I thought, sure, I was going to get a book deal out of that, and I didn't. Uh, it was a huge epiphany for me because what I learned was, as good as I thought my manuscript was, it was not good enough. Yeah. And I came back uh, to, to Norfolk, and I joined the, the Muse Writer Center and started participating in, in fiction writer studios. And that elevated that experience, dealing not only with the instructors, but with the fellow students who are all great readers as well as great writers, uh, elevated my craft to the point where I was able to, to get my book published and the subsequent book published. So I will always, uh, always owe a huge debt of gratitude to the Muse Writer Center. And you don't even have to live in Tidewater, Virginia to, to, to participate because since the COVID, uh, you know, sometimes from crisis comes opportunity, uh, everything they do is online and we have people, there's a lady in our fiction studio who dials in from Tokyo, Japan on Zoom uh, at midnight, midnight her time. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I, 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 a big plug for the Muse Writer Center. Uh, as for my books, uh, they're exclusively on Amazon. Uh, Amazon you know, uh, mm -hmm. Just go to Amazon and look up Mike Prince and my books are there. My, my website is mikejkrentz.com. And uh, I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, even TikTok, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm just really kind of learning how to use uh, and LinkedIn as well. But uh, people who are interested in the books, you can find them at um, uh, Amazon, with the exception of that already is available at Prince Books uh, right here in Norfolk, Virginia. Nice, very nice. All right, so um, that's what we have for today. Um, for those of you watching, be sure to stick around for the credits because Mike is sharing the trailer for Dead Already and it's a really good one. So stick around for that. Um, to my Patreon supporters, stick around because Mike has something just for you guys. So until next time, everybody, stay safe, be blessed and have fun reading. I appreciate it very much. Absolutely. Thank <laughs> you.